FTX blew up several weeks ago. FTX was something called a cryptocurrency exchange, sort of. It was related in ways most people don't understand to the cryptocurrency business. It exploded in what apparently was the largest fraud in the history of money ever. Billions of dollars to yeah, what exactly is going on here? What was FTX? What's the future of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular? Welcome to Tucker Carlson today. So a company called FTX blew up several weeks ago. FTX was something called a cryptocurrency exchange, sort of. It was related in ways most people don't understand to the cryptocurrency business. It exploded in what apparently was the largest fraud in the history of money ever. Billions of dollars disappeared overnight. And in that collapse, it discredited in the minds of many the whole concept of cryptocurrency. And that would include Bitcoin. People are using that collapse. In fact, some of the people who should have prevented it, some of the regulators who should have been on top of it before the guy who ran it walked off with the money of lots of different investment funds. Those people are using the collapse of FTX to further regulate the entire space of cryptocurrency. Is that a good idea? What exactly is going on here? What was FTX? What's the future of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular? There's probably nobody better to talk this subject than Max Kaiser, a financial journalist, author of The Book of Max, one of the earliest investors in Bitcoin and to this day what they call a Bitcoin maximalist. Max, thanks so much for coming on. Tucker, it's great to be here. And you're right, there's a lot of confusion now, Bitcoin and crypto and what's happening with FTX. Uh, but when the case of Bitcoin, it's designed to be attacked and it's designed to be disruptive. Uh, we brought with you today, I've got here this wonderful Bitcoin grenade as a gift. Okay, good. For well, you. I accept all weapons. Yeah. And, Thank you. Uh, to really get, drive home the point that Bitcoin is designed to disrupt the financial system, the fiat money system. And the way it's designed, Tucker, is that the more you try to attack it, the stronger it gets. Because the way to attack it is to throw computational power at it, which enhances those to continue to mine it, which means that the hash rate, which is the underlying algorithm that gives it its power, gets stronger, which means it gets more secure, and therefore the price goes higher. So it's actually, it's a unique piece of technology that people either love it or hate it. It's almost like a litmus test. If you're essentially a corrupt individual, you become more corrupt, like Sam Bankman-Fried. He was born a corrupt individual. Bitcoin made him more corrupt. If you're somebody who's more noble with intentions, like a Michael Saylor, it elevates you to greater heights of what was underlying a noble instinct. And Bitcoin has the power to do that. And so what we're seeing now is really Another chapter in the history of Bitcoin where the traditional finance is imploding. Uh, the central banks are nervous. The central banks are having hearings. The, Christine Lagarde is quite upset because she says that Bitcoin is an escape hatch. And of course, she's right because you're escaping the central bank system, the fiat money system, with money that allows people to have unconfiscatable property that's on completely outside of the current system. And that scares people. If you have a population owning unconfiscatable property that cannot be assailed by any authority, it's completely decentralized. And, and that's why it's causing the shock waves around the world. Well, they've always hated it for that reason. Yes. That is the promise of Bitcoin. You work, you buy something that you actually own that's not subject to the whims of whatever political system you live under. And that's a very appealing idea, I think, to people who watch our systems in collapse, which they are now collapsing. But explain, if you would, in a way that viewers can understand, non-specialists, the difference between what Sam Bankman-Fried was doing, he was in the crypto space, he said, and what you're talking about, which is also in the minds of most in the crypto space. How are they different? Right. So Sam Bankman-Fried, the key to his empire of fraud is that he created his own play money token called FTT. And he was able to create that without any oversight or any uh, tie to anything underlying um, it, giving it value whatsoever. And this is a whole cryptographic scam that's been going on with the crypto market where individuals, and he's not the only one, there are many people that create these what are called altcoins or scam coins. And they create, uh, Ether is another one, or Cardano or XRP. These are all 
uh, coins that are just created, and then they list these coins on each other's exchange, and then they buy them from each other to create a price, and then they use the enhanced price, which is now as a collateral value, to go buy something like Sam Bankman Fried did, real estate in the Bahamas. Right. Right. So it's a Ponzi scheme. It's a fraud. So they're converting, it's alchemy. They're converting air Total. into real property. The, the closest analogy I'll give you would be in 2008 during the financial crisis, the ability of Wall Street banks to create derivatives right. and mortgage backed securities. Right. So they were simply taking something, a plain vanilla mortgage, and then they were rehypothecating it and repackaging it and creating digital um, financial alchemy to make something that was worthless have a, a quotable value and then using that as collateral to float more derivatives. And as Chuck Prince of Citibank said at the time, this will continue until the music stops. Well, guess what? The music stopped and the whole house of cards collapsed and the central bank, who was really responsible for the whole thing by making money so cheap to fund the scam, came in and made money even cheaper. So instead of there being any accountability, instead of there be people going to jail, like William K. Black during the 1970s SNL crisis sent a thousand bankers to jail. And what they did in America was instead of making that particular type of fraud illegal, they simply changed the laws to make it so that it, it was not never going to be prosecuted again. And it opened the door in the 1980s for all kinds of other scams, which then led to the 2008 crisis and the current crisis we have today. We have laws in the books, Tucker, but we don't have anyone enforcing those laws. Laws. And implied in the Sam Bankman Free crisis uh, scam is none other than Gary Gensler over at the SEC, who should have been calling time on this a long ago, but we find out that he's actually involved and that there's some what I would call collusion. And the problem is in America, you have a country that's ruled by a kleptocracy. Every institution in America is tied to Wall Street in some way. They've all been financialized. They all use cheap money. They're all cross collateraling each other's assets. They're all using that money to buy real assets. And they're all undermining the economy in fundamental ways, which lead to inflation, which lead to unemployment, which lead to all kinds of dysfunctions in the economy, in our medical system, in all across the institutions. It all goes back to essentially the deregulation that happened 40 years ago, which led to the financialization and the over indebtedness, the over leveraging of the economy. And now in 2022, since interest rates are going up, that's the end of the mirage, that the bubble has been popped. And if the FTX scandal and the Sam Bankman Fried scandal was like the last dregs of a 40 year bacchanal in cheap money, no regulation and crooked bankers. I I have no background in any of the areas you're describing, but just as a as a watcher of what's happened over that period, I sense everything you say is true. You worked within that system for a while. Did you give us a quick right. summary. Right. So I started background. in the 1982 on Wall Street as a stockbroker. I worked there for for eight years. I worked at Payne Weber. I worked at Oppenheimer. I worked at Sherson Lehman Hutton. I worked at Alex Brown and Company. And um, so I had a front row seat during a period in financial history in America where a lot of innovation, so-called, was, was brought to fore because of the appearance in the 70s, late 70s, of the discount brokers. So what happened is to, for Wall Street to compete with the discounts, like the Charles Schwab's and right, others, right. they went on a spree of inventing products. And they went uh, and they created, for example, Mike Milken and junk bonds. That was a way to grab back some revenue from they were losing it to the discounters. So they created the leverage buyout, became huge. And in America, you had the corporate raiders who came in, Carl Icahn and others who went to Mike Milken and they borrowed tons of money and they bought assets and then they stripped those assets. And so Wall Street was let loose in, in effect. And Alan Greenspan at the time at the Fed was saying, well, you know, my job is not really price stability anymore. My job is to service Wall Street. Anytime they get in trouble, I'm going to make interest rates cheaper, and I'm going to bail out Wall Street. That was the new mandate for the Fed, and that's that they call it the Greenspan put. And they, and, and they loved him for it. I remember it very well. But why do you think Greenspan, who was smart, who's still alive, by the way, uh, who is smart, why do you think he did that? Well, later on in, in retirement, he, he said publicly that he regrets now, and he looks back, and he said he was wrong, uh, that the idea of simply throwing the keys uh, to, of the castle to Wall Street, letting them do whatever they wanted to do was, was incorrect. But at the time, remember, Alan Greenspan was doing ads for Apple Computer, and he was a media figure. Yes. And so he was very egocentrically driven to have the attention drawn to him. He was not like Paul Volcker, who preceded him, who took rates up to 16 to 17 percent 
uh, to wipe out the inflation that was the result of the Vietnam War and, and all the profligate spending in the U.S. So he became a celebrity. And this was the first time really you had financiers become celebrities. Flash forward to Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson and the financial crisis, where they're on the cover of Time magazine as saving the world by, uh, and the 2008 crisis with Timothy Geithner was atrocious a uh, chapter in, in American financial history where laws were broken and rewritten uh, on the fly, uh, where Hank Paulson put a gun to Congress' head and said, give us uh, $780 billion right now or we're going to crash the market. And the next day, the markets did start to crash. And then Congress said, oh, sorry, yeah, we'll give you your money. So they they're hold uh, the Congress hostage because they can manipulate prices. It's very, very easy. Uh, my experience on Wall Street, will, I can tell you, and having invented a technology, the virtual specialist technology, which is patent number 59501176, it's a way to make virtual markets. And I can tell you, and it was bought by Cantor Fitzgerald in 2001. And um, it's a, it, I can tell you technologically how to, how to manipulate markets using algorithms quite easily to create the prices you want. The markets today, Tucker, are not the result of buyers and sellers coming together and creating a market price. That's it's, what we imagine. It's the result of, so let's say, a Goldman Sachs saying, we want the price to be X, so we're going to fill the trades in to get to X. So they determine the prices in advance that they want to see. Well, that's not a real market. No, it's a command and control system. It's central planning. It's not capitalism at all. Don't blame, don't blame capitalism for the ills of the American economy because we don't live in a capitalist society. We live in a command and control society where the fundamental element of the economy money, the price of that money is set by the central committee, the Politburo, known as the federal, uh, the FOMC. That's not a market driven economy. Uh, so that's a problem. Number one, Bitcoin solves this because Bitcoin is not controlled by anyone. It is pure market driven. And the price of Bitcoin and the value of Bitcoin is dictated purely by people's um, willingness to have or, want or need to have an unconfiscatable, uncensorable f way to, f uh, to own property outside of what they see as a, a very big corrupt system. Now, you had Michael Saylor on your show who did a very great explanation about how Bitcoin beats inflation. You know, what I would add to it is that Bitcoin beats the kleptocracy. Bitcoin beats the, the inherent fraud and and the problems in the U.S. economy as it has now descended into what would almost be argued a permanent state of dysfunction by a, a, a captured regulators, uh, venal, uh, ineffective politicians, and um, a media, uh, present company excluded, but a media that's in also in their pocket as well. So we have a, really a crisis. So I want to ask you to pause there, and I, I want to play you a montage that we put together that I... I watch even in my spare time because it's just, it, this needs to be recorded somehow on the blockchain so it's never lost. <laughs> this is the response to Sam Bankman Fried, who I think before I play this, we would both agree was like a transparent fraud, like obvious, right? Yes. Right. So no normal person, other than I guess Sequoia, would ever give money to a guy who plays video games during interviews, right? <laughs> but here's how he was treated by the US media, financial media. They call him the JP Morgan of crypto, right? Yeah, <laughs> the Michael Jordan of crypto, if you will. <laughs> so why should you care about a floppy-haired, vegan, like fidget-spinning crypto billionaire who occasionally sleeps on a beanbag chair? During the so-called crypto winter, the 30-year-old CEO has been referred to as crypto's white knight. JP Morgan of this generation, Sam Bankman frieds FTX. Is he the Jay Gould of our era or is he the JP Morgan of our era? I think it's yet to be determined. Yet to be determined. Is he, the, is he Vanderbilt? He could be. Is he Harriman? Possibly. Is he the Credit Mobile scandal? Is he Carnegie? If he gives a lot of libraries, he is. We spend all our time in my world making fun of the political press because it's so inept and partisan. But it, the financial press, it's, you've dealt with your whole life. I mean, what is that? It's the worst. The financial press is much worse. Uh, <laughs> That's so sad. It be, and not only that, but it's openly telegraphing to the other, the, the financial community, the frauds that they're conducting, how the frauds are doing, and how you can participate in those frauds. Like the Financial Times is essentially a, a Bible on committing financial fraud. The Wall Street Journal is essentially the playbook on how to commit financial fraud. Um, 
the typical financial media at CNBC really talk about fraud. There's nothing inherently uh, with any integrity whatsoever in these financial markets. Uh, but to your point, with the coverage of Sam Bankman-Fried, here you have a situation where this is, by the way, Sam, uh, his company, FTX, was launched the same day as, as Biden launched his presidential campaign. I don't know if you know that, but it was a bit of a coincidence there. But so so I, I didn't know that. And, and so yeah. that would have been 2000, late 2019 yeah. at some point. So, so it's now 2022. So in three years, he made billions of dollars. How do you do that? Well, you do it by, as I explained a little bit earlier. So let's dig into this. After Bitcoin was created, a lot of people decided that they could come up with digital currencies that were going to... Be, that, that could uh, be used uh, as scams. Essentially, they're, they're, it was very easy to create play money. And I did this myself, as I mentioned, in the 1990s when I did the Hollywood Stock Exchange, I created a virtual currency as part of that game. So I know this market very, very well. And so I can tell you intimately in detail from a technological point of view, the ins and outs of these frauds that are being perpetrated. And these tokens that are being created but in the trillions, they have their their purpose is solely to be uh, picked up by this cartel, if you will, of VCs uh, out in California, uh, Sequoia. You mentioned as part of it, uh, and others who are involved in um, a, um, a a collusion in, in in racketeering. This is the thing about it, Tucker, is that they're involved in a clear cut case of criminal enterprise. It's a criminal enterprise. It's a racket. They need to be going after it with RICO. Uh, the Andreessen Horowitz, Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, Sequoia, BlackRock, they're involved in a criminal enterprise and a racket by boosting the price of worthless tokens on each other's exchanges and then using that token as collateral to fund things like, oh, the war machine in Ukraine. Oh, Joe Biden's reelection campaign. Oh, the midterms, which we now know was highly influenced by money that was manufactured out of thin air. They can't get the money from Congress. They can't get the money from their donors. So they created this entity called FTX, which is a huge slush fund. Essentially, it's a slush fund disguised as a crypto exchange, which is managed by somebody. I, I, the way I see Sam Bankman Fried, he's kind of a cross between Bernie Madoff and Charles Manson. Right, because he's got his little cadre of drug addled sex maniacs in the Bahamas, and he's perpetrating the biggest uh, Ponzi scheme in history. So imagine that the mix of Charles Manson and Bernie Madoff, and you end up with this freaky, fuzzy haired, uh, larcenistic <laughs> criminal who's down there perpetrating the biggest fraud in history. And there the Democrats are like, yeah, I'll take your money because we're morally uh, need. It doesn't matter if the money is stolen. Our moral agenda means that we can take stolen money because we're, that's the way we are. We need to fight over there in Ukraine. We need to make all the you know the, you know the moral turpitude of the Democrats is insanely over the top. So, but they they've run out of money, so they had to resort to this essentially this racket. And the racket, you can go back and you can trace the origins of it to the past few decades where we've had very similar instances of financial fraud and abuse, the 2008 crisis I mentioned, the SNL crisis, long-term capital management, if you remember that, the late 90s, they were engaged in a massive uh, scheme, really, Ponzi scheme, that blew up and out, they were bailed out by the Fed. The, the, the hope is always that the Fed will bail you out. The hope is always that the financiers will bail you out, that there will be no accountability. And the question is, well, why wouldn't they have that assumption? Because when in the last 40 years have these financiers not gotten bailed out? When has any of them gone to jail? Okay, Bernie Madoff, we can, okay, he went to jail. But we're talking about literally thousands of people who, if they were properly prosecuted, would be in jail, as William K. Black did in the early 1980s against the uh, SNL crisis. It might be before your time, but remember the Keating Five, Charles yes, Keating, of course. all those people were engaged in the um, essentially mismarketing uh, certificates of deposits at savings banks and then using that as collateral to go buy yachts and property. And it was a very similar scam, but a rudimentary version of it. So all we've seen in the last 40 years is they're getting worse and worse. The, the remedy for the 2008 crisis was not to try to put the bad guys in jail. What 
Bernanke did was they, allowed, they gave him a credit card 10 times bigger and said, just do the exact same thing. Obama, same thing. They said, we're not going to put you in jail. But Obama said, don't focus on the past. Don't focus on the past. We're going to look to the future. So we're going to give the guys who committed these crimes 10 times to 20 times the credit, and they're going to do the, exactly the same thing. Now, at that time, we said, within 10 to 12 years, the exact same thing is going to happen, but 10 times worse. And that's where we're at today. We were off by two years. 14 years later, it's the global financial crisis part two, and it's because of the exact same things happening all over again. Um, I wrote, the, you know, re remember collateralized mortgage-backed securities? For Very well, okay. yes. There's a new product just this past week. It's called private equity-backed securities. <laughs> so they're taking worthless private equity <laughs> they're wrapping it in a new. I'm product. adding that to the list of things I'm not investing in. No, but they, they've already sold, you know, half a billion to a billion of it, because. What is it? It's it's a private equity backed note where they're taking the stubs from busted private equity deals that are to completely illiquid, and that's what I said. If you read the Wall Street Journal, it's like you're reading a how-to book on how to commit fraud. Here it is. Illiquid private equity stakes bundled into a security known as a collateralized fund obligation with a high credit rating, of course, because they put a little treasury in there to give it a, it's like reverse drug dealing. You know, you put in a treasury uh, bill to make your garbage seem higher. It's called a CFO, collateralized debt obligations. Uh, and so they've already sold billions of these. Who would buy something like that? Pension accounts. Because pension accounts are, in our country, the people who run them, are picked by Wall Street, and they pick stupid people on purpose. <laughs> I'm, I'm now, when I was on Wall Street, this is truth. If I had a trade, let's say I had a trade that I made, and I had like a half a million dollar or a million dollar error on that trade. We do, you stick it in the error account for the firm. There's no account number. So you don't really recognize it as existing. But you know on the books of the firm, there's a big error. Then a week later, you're talking to the teacher's pension account, or the fireman's pension account, it's a huge pool of money, it's run by an idiot. And you say, okay, it's time to top up the pension account, we're, we're dumping a bundle of securities into the pension account, into that bundle goes that bad trade. It's a loss, but they just bundle it in and they make it disappear. And the pension accounts are always underperforming the market because Wall Street uses pension accounts as a toxic waste dump. They have for decades. I myself, but those are people's retirement accounts. Uh, but they, uh, unfortunately, have no one representing them on Wall Street, except for some idiot that's handpicked by Wall Street. Robert Citrone is in the case of a pension manager, if you go back and look it up, who was caught, you know, for a, it's easy to get a guy like that to do your bidding. You know, you, you show up, you've got your nice suit from Wall Street. He's a schlub in the middle of nowhere. You go to the local strip bar, you buy him a cocktail, and he's going to put a half a billion dollars worth of shit, in the, excuse me, into the pension account uh, because he's an idiot. And he's a purpose, he's a useful idiot. And that's the pension account, that's the pension business in America. Why are pensions underperforming? Why is there a pension crisis in America? Because Wall Street uses it as a waste dump. That's truth. That's the way it is. And the idea is that if they, if they implode, then they're effectively backed by. They'll the, get bailed out by the Congress, right? They get bailed out. The SNL crisis. They got bailed out. That was the trick. They said these CDs are guaranteed by the government. Let's 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 use the government as the backstop. Same thing in the 2008 crisis. Same thing with the FTX crisis. They're banking on the Feds bailing them out. Is this guy in jail? Even though he's patently. In a, so you're nationalizing the risk and privatizing the upside. Yeah. The, Absolutely, but it's gone on for decades. And it gets worse and worse because, especially during an environment of the past 40 years where interest rates got cheaper and cheaper. So the basic fuel for financial fraud is cheap money. Yes. And the central bank, which is now, okay, reluctantly raising rates, they should have been raising rates years ago because that's the role of the central bank, price stability. And they needed to come in and proactively make sure that the malinvestment and the abuse was curtailed by making the cost of abuse and financial fraud high. That's what a higher interest rate does. If you have an idea like, oh, I'm Sam Bankman Fried, I'm gonna create this $32 billion financial fraud and I'm gonna use borrowed money, which by the way, the cost of that borrowed money is nothing. You know, there's no incentive not to do that. And right. if, I, if I mess up, I'm gonna get bailed out. But if interest rates are 5%, now suddenly you have a barrier to your fraud. Right. So that's what interest rates, one of the roles that interest rates can do is it creates a barrier to entry for fraudsters. But if you keep it always at zero and getting lower, uh, you are inviting fraud. That's why I say the big- And crushing inflation. I mean, if you're taking the right. value out of money, I mean- Well, the inflation, the inflation was building up over years, as you know. 
um, the inflation reporting under reports inflation by hedonic adjustments, uh, by constantly substituting in the basket right, of CPI right. for hamburger for meat, uh, they'll say, well, your, your, your laptop, had the processor is twice as fast, so we're going to say that it's half as, uh, as, as expensive in the CPI index. They do stuff like that to keep it really low. Also, the cost of living adjustment, they need to keep inflation low because the feds don't want to pay that of to course. higher. So they artificially keep the CPI number as low as they possibly can. So meanwhile, all that money, which is the, the actual inflation, is building up in the, the asset prices. So the stock market, the real estate market, the chateau, mar you know, the chateaus in Switzerland market, the, all those things are up 15, 20 percent a year because of all that money that's being printed. Uh, until now in 2022, be, you know, I mean, to be honest, it was when Russia invaded Ukraine that kind of called the time on this whole thing. You know, um, they essentially said, you know what? We're, we actually believe we are better at pricing oil than you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're pricing oil in Chicago and it's totally manipulated. And, you know, we, since we're the producer, yeah, I think we'll price the oil from here on. And suddenly inflation went out of the roof because they took it out of the hands of the financiers. Right. Right. And now the pricing power for commodities in the world are with the producers. That means the BRICS. That means Russia. Of that course. means China. That means... Uh, Brazil, right? So that's where the that's where America now is in a real conundrum because how are they going to suddenly get out of this mess that they've created by lax financial oversight for 40 years? The Sam Bankman-Fried, as abhorrent and ridiculous as it is, he's actually just the tip of the iceberg. There is really, I always say that if you took fraud out of the American economy, there would be nothing left. It's an economy run almost entirely on fraud. And fraud is celebrated. Like uh, the, the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, people don't see that as a cautionary tale and they should avoid committing fraud. It's used as a playbook by this generation. Like, I'm going to steal whatever I can as fast as I can. That's the morals. That's the ethos you find. So you, you think the war in Ukraine was a pivot point yeah, because, in our economy? Yes. So what would explain the religious fervor with which the... With Wall Street and the Democratic Party and parts of the Republican Party are backing that war. Uh, at this point, you should put the meme up of uh, Zelensky at the laundromat. That, that's the appropriate yeah. meme at this point. It's, it's pure money laundering. It, it is, right? No question. The FTX is intimately involved. Without question. It, the, the, the facts, the figures, the numbers are quite plain to see for anyone. They needed money to launder. Uh, Ukraine is where they launder it. Uh, thir less than 30 percent of the weapons actually make it to the battlefield. It, it, it's a complete and utter disgusting incidence of of the elites in this country ripping people off uh, and calling it something, having something to do with an agenda. It's propaganda. OK, it's propaganda, propaganda and money laundering, a, a, a kleptocracy. It, all these things are colliding, Tucker. And it's. On one hand, as, a, as, as somebody who's been in the industry for as long as I have, and as somebody who's almost like an aficionado of tracking all these various financial tricks and frauds over the years, because it's kind of interesting, it, it is, at the end of the day, kind of sad, because they are literally throwing the country under the bus at this point. I, I, I don't see how... The, this is why El Salvador has become the beacon. So El Salvador is now the shining city on the hill. El Salvador is now where hope lives in the world. Uh, because you have a president who recognized the potential of Bitcoin early, who recognized that everything else was garbage, and none of these scandals are hitting El Salvador right now. There's no FTX scandal. There's no Mike Novogratz. There's no Charles uh, Hoskinson. There's no Brock Pierce in El Salvador because he pushed them all out. And now uh, with the, they formally created a Bitcoin office. They formally created new securities laws, which will open the way for volcano bonds. So they're going to escape the IMF by producing their own uh, volcano bond financing mechanism, which I'm consulting on. What's a volcano bond? So you're tapping into geothermal energy to uh, reward investors with a Bitcoin dividend uh, via a bond offering, essentially is what it is. So it's a volcano backed bond. And the, the proceeds are used to enhance their geothermal energy capacity because they have a lot of stranded energy. Uh, we already know it works because in Iceland, they developed a huge um, Bitcoin mining industry tapping into the Icelandic geothermal energy, of which they have a lot. 
before they Iceland, uh, well, the way that they would export that energy is that they invited aluminum smelters to come like Alcoa, and they smelt aluminum in Iceland using the very cheap geothermal energy. Yes. Then they export that aluminum. It takes enormous Iceland. energy to smelt metal. Right. So right. That's, that's a GDP boost for Iceland by because they, they, they can't export the energy because energy degrades as you yes, leave the course. source. But if you create a, an aluminum ingot, you can export it. You see what I'm saying? So they turn geothermal into aluminum. Here in El Salvador, they're turning geothermal into Bitcoin, the hardest money known to, the, to, to man in history that gives financial freedom to all Salvadorans and anyone around the world and unconfiscatable, immutable, uncensorable money.